us. The feature tonight is Kadita Kenner. She is, let's see if I get this right, a Westchester native, um, a former writer, producer, and director for college sports television programming in Charlotte, North Carolina. So I can attest to the fact that yesterday she was suffering a little bit from the cold. <laughs> Um, Jane and I and, and um, the rest of you may have met Kanita through Tuesdays with Toomey. And um, her office is right around the corner at uh, Why Courts Matter. And she is very kind that she comes every Tuesday and gives up her lunch hour to lead our rallies. And she is the best darn rally leader that you want to meet. Um, and on a personal note, we are kindred spirits because she's post a lot about her cat. So <laughs> I am just going to turn the program over to her. Please give a warm welcome to Kenita Kenner of Black Coast Society. How's everybody doing? All right, I, I really appreciate coming out here. Uh, Indivisible Works was one of the first organizations I went to when I started speaking about Black Lives Matter. So you guys are home to me. I feel like I just am part of the group now, even though I don't live here. I'm part of it. You can't get rid of me. And so I do want to just uh, add a little bit to that. I am a Westchester, uh, Pennsylvania native. I say that because sometimes they think New York, but no, it's Westchester, <laughs> Not to be confused with Chester, Pennsylvania. <laughs> and uh, I was born in Monroeville, right outside of Pittsburgh. And I grew up in Westchester. I'm a graduate of Henderson High School and uh, Temple University. Any owls here? You need one owl in the room. Yay, Temple Owls are here! <laughs> and um, I moved to Charlotte, North Carolina in 2012 to follow a, a career path. A dream of mine is to produce college sports, which was great. You know, I moved to North Carolina, that's where ESPNU is. So it was a great experience. And then what I found out was that the HB2 laws, remember HB2 in North Carolina, the bathroom laws? Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of us worked in college sports laws, didn't you? Because the NCAA pulled out of North Carolina while they still had that bigoted legislation. And so I found myself unemployed in August. It was August. August of 2012, 2016. And uh, I got a phone call from the Hillary campaign, just did all transparency so you know my background. I got a call from the Hillary campaign wanting me to volunteer, and I said, actually, I need a job. And uh, they hired me as an organizer. I did work on campaigns before, so it wasn't a stretch. And I worked on that campaign in Charlotte, North Carolina, another hot area, another hot area just like Pennsylvania. A lot of visits, I got to introduce Michelle Obama. That was very nerve wracking. It was an awesome experience. I got to uh, meet her in person. She is beautiful in person, very tall and beautiful. And after the election, you know, I woke up on November 9th, I guess, that morning, after the ugly cry that evening. And I just knew that I couldn't go back to college sports. I can't, you know, what's, what's college football and basketball right now? I need to save democracy, right? So I had a Facebook friend, Mark Steer. Anybody know Mark Steer, Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center? We're Facebook friends. We were friends for about five years. He friended me on Facebook. This is the power of Facebook. If you're not on, get on. And uh, we networked for five years on Facebook. And he said, I have a job in Pennsylvania. You want to move back home? And here I am, back home in Pennsylvania. And now I'm advocating for our federal courts. And uh, I'll tell you why I do this at the end. That kind of makes sense to you. So I'm glad to be with you today. And we have a, a really great program for you. But first, I want to celebrate the one year anniversary of Indivisible Works. Congratulations, one year. <laughs> and I must say, Pennsylvania, you know, the resistance groups in Pennsylvania get a lot of credit because there's so much going on here in Pennsylvania. The activity is getting national attention. We had a French magazine come to interview folks in the resistance groups in Pennsylvania because they know this is the hot spot, especially those that are advocating against TUI. Um, this is just the spot to be when it comes to that. So great work, Indivisible Works. You're making a difference. I want you to know that, that what you do makes a difference. You may not feel like it sometimes, 
but it does. And then we also, we're a little early with this, but we do want to celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And I'm going to kind of bring it to you in, in terms of how this relates to the federal courts as well. It's a nice little uh, quote there by Dr. Martin Luther King. Ordinarily, a person leaving a courtroom with a conviction behind him would wear a somber face, but I left with a smile. I knew that I was a convicted criminal, but I was proud of my crime. Yeah. Who's doing some things they're proud of right now? Yeah? Yeah, doing some things you're proud of. You're going to build the right side of history. What you're doing is right and it's just. There is uh, Dr. Martin Luther King getting arrested outside of a courtroom in 1958. And it should be lost on us that as a nation, as we celebrate his birthday, we must take pride in the time when protesters and judges alike brave threats of violence as they challenge racist segregation. It wasn't just the protesters, we need the judges too. And then there's this showman. Anybody know who Judge Frank Johnson is? Just as important as President Johnson was in the time. Frank Johnson is a district judge from the Middle District of Alabama. Lots of good things going on in Alabama right now, right? <laughs> and so he was in, he was a judge during the times of bus boycotts and Selma marches. And he was instrumental in making sure that King's vision and all the, you know, the visions of all the civil rights leaders came to fruition. And it, we need the courts. I mean, we want to get the public opinion behind us. And we also want to get our legislators behind us. But we need our judges behind us too to make it happen. If it wasn't for him and his decisions, there would have been no Selma marches because they weren't able to get across the bridge safely at the time. It was up to him to make sure that happened. And Dr. King said, you know, this is written about him in 1999, that he is the true meaning of the word justice, right? What does justice mean? Yeah. All right, so when we talk about civil rights, we know about voting rights, right? And voting suppression. Isn't the goal that everyone should be able to vote? Isn't that the goal? Yeah, one person would vote. Right, that's the goal. It should be easy to vote, not hard. And so voting rights is a big thing you'll see with the courts. You also see justice reform and policing. I know a lot of work here at Burks is with the Burks Detention Centers immigration issues that we have here in Berks County, particularly in Reading. Immigration, as I mentioned, the Muslim travel ban, the DACA program, all these things, all these issues will be arbitrated in federal courts at some point. And the courts. All right, so let's, let's go back to November 9th, that morning woke up after the election. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to take you back then. What were the issues you cared about when you woke up that morning? What were you scared about? Call them out. What were you scared about that morning when you woke up? Democracy. Democracy. Concerned about democracy? Healthcare. Healthcare. What's going to happen to the ACA? Women's rights. Women's the rights. The environment. The climate. The climate. I mean, yeah, it's just, it's just weather, right? <laughs> Race relations. Race relations. Hatred in general. Say that again. Said hatred in general. Hatred yes. in general. Just so many things we were concerned about. We woke up on November 9th and we continue to be concerned about these things. Frederick Douglass said that power concedes nothing without a demand. So we're going to demand what we need. So there's a few things I want to do with you today. So we're going to talk about judicial nomination and confirmation process. We're going to talk about what's happening in Pennsylvania. We're gonna go over some lessons learned as we've been fighting, and then strategies and calls to action because you gotta make a demand. All right, we get. All right, do I have your attention? I got it. Trump says he might get to replace all three of these. He's gonna, he says he's gonna to get to replace uh, Sonia Sotomayor because she has diabetes. It's just it's not healthy. So, let's keep the process along. Then we have Justice Kennedy, who has said he's going to resign in the next year. And then we also have uh, 
the notorious RGB, right? Yeah. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, so um, I always say this, put her in that Betty White bubble. Whatever Betty White is doing, <laughs> do that to her. But I think she's going to outlive us all because I hear she has a workout regimen that's like incredible. So yeah, so uh, try sleeping tonight with that. Yeah. You would give Donald Trump four of nine Supreme Court justices? Elections have consequences. Chuck Grassley. Chuck Grassley out of Iowa is our Senate Judiciary Committee chairman. And he likes to make statements, and I like to quote him and use his words against him if he's going to say them out loud or publish them. And he said that although the president, speaking of Obama here in 2016, although the president would like Congress to rubble stamp every proposal, he suggests that's not the way our separation of powers works, right? Three branches of government, independent, checks and balances, right? That's how, we, that's how we've been rolling for like 1776 on, right? So there's a few things I want to do today, tonight. I want to inform you because education is power. If education wasn't power, folks wouldn't try so hard to make sure you weren't educated. And then I want to scare the heck out of you a little bit. I did that with uh, four out of nine Supreme Court justices. And then finally, I want to spur you to action. And I want you to celebrate a win because we've had some wins. So the federal courts, who knows about the federal courts? Any lawyers in the room? There should be at least one. No lawyers in the room? Anybody pre law in college or have a real interest in the, in the courts? Huh? All right. Well, good. This is going to be a learning educational experience. All right, federal courts. So we have, uh, there's levels. I don't need this. Can you get me? Can you get me up there? Yeah, there you go. That's great. I'm going to put these in your Women on the bench. Who are we behind? Take a guess. 
Yes, yes. Alabama. 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 Who said that first? You over here. <laughs> Get back here. <laughs> You're close. I'm gonna give it to you anyway. <laughs> Arkansas. It was, it was five. Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi. So Pennsylvania, we are behind Louisiana, Mississippi, and Texas. But it comes to women on the bench. Really? I thought we were progressive here in Pennsylvania. What happened? It's not. <laughs> the process, how does it work? So I'll tell you how it has worked prior to this current administration. In the past, home state senators would actually send some nominees to the president. They have committees. Toomey has a committee, Casey has a committee. They're usually lawyers. They get together on, you know, once, twice a year, and they say, I think this attorney, you know, up and coming, he might be a good circuit court appeals judge or a district court judge. They'll take these names and then they'll give them to the president of the United States. At that point, the president of the United States will make the nomination. At that point, after they've been nominated, they'll go to the Senate Judiciary Committee for a hearing. That's where Chuck Rastley and those on the, on the uh, committee will vote. Right now, they've been voting strictly on a partisan level. And it's 11 to 9, as how it's been, 11 Republicans, 9 Democrats. If they hear the Senate Judiciary Committee, then they go to the full Senate for a full vote. Right now, they only need 51 votes to get there. It used to be 60. So if you write it, that's the nuclear option, all that. <coughs> and they're confirmed. So that's how it goes. Usually, Casey and Toomey will say, I like this person. The president will say, OK, I like him too. I'll nominate them. And they go through the process. And how, that's how it has worked. Nationally, right now, we have 137 federal vacancies. These are lifetime appointments. Donald Trump had actually put more than 150 people on the federal benches for a lifetime. A generation or two. That's what we're up against. Elections have consequences. How many have you played so far? So far, 19. How come you often? We'll get to that. Yes. So this is right now what we're looking like. In Pennsylvania, we have nine federal judicial vacancies. One for the Circuit Court of Appeals. That's the next step to the Supreme Court. And then eight district. And we have three nominees that just came out on the 20th of December. They are two or renominations of Obama's. <coughs> you saw the fiasco of Peterson? Yeah. The, uh, yeah. the guy who knew nothing. He knew nothing. He never tried a case. Yeah. Never did anything. But he's going to be a federal yeah, judge for a lifetime. We have three nominees. So two are renominations of Obama's. Two women from Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Baxter and Horan. Uh, Baxter gets low in reviews from Art Intel. Horan, we're a little worried about. Find out more about her. And then Mr. Kenny, uh, who used to be a <coughs> sheriff in Denver County, or the Eastern District. So it was Eastern, the Middle, and Western. The ladies are for the Western District of Pennsylvania, and Kenny is for the Eastern. Two of these folks are Temple Reds, and two of them uh, also went to Penn State. Any Penn Stateers? Well, let's go to school. <laughs> Mitch McConnell said it was one of his best things ever was to obstruct in Obama's last two years in his office. One of his best, most proud moments. They actually, I read something today that they said that if, if Hillary would have won, they would have obstructed her from even filling the Supreme Court for four years. So all these folks were Obama nominees, and they, um, they just sat there on the Senate floor waiting to get a vote. They went through the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, the committee voted on them, said they were qualified enough to go through, and they never got uh, a Senate vote. A lot of women and a lot of folks of color. So they were all being held up for the Senate vote? Yes. They found that part. By Mitch McConnell, who said, I'm not going to call for a Senate vote. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the tweeter in chief, right? Oh, wait, Katie, I have a question. Yes. So they never voted on them, <coughs> and now Trump comes into office. Yep. So do did they remove all of them? From yeah, the that all bucks away. That new, yeah, it all goes away. So uh, he tells the truth about this. Um, we'll 
start thank, at the bottom here. Thanks to McConnell and the Senate GOP who are appointing highly qualified or high quality federal district and appeals court judges at a record clip. Our courts are rapidly changing for the better. Half of that is true. Um, he is the most prolific in history, Donald Trump, yes. at appointing judges in his first year in office. No one has beaten him. The only person that came close was Nixon. Mm. He's filled 19 judgeships already, most of them for the Circuit Court of Appeals, which is the next level to the Supreme Court. So let's see. <coughs> Do whatever they want to do, really, at this point. But I, I would think that even 
public input, so it's sort of You would think. You would think. How about being able to, you know, like, this is one thing. Survey trends, and we're talking about Dr. Martin Luther King a lot today. This comes from the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. This is an example of what was happening in Obama's last two years. The bottom row of green there are all Obama nominees. These are folks that Obama wanted to see uh, placed on federal courts across the country. All those nominations sat there and never got votes. Donald Trump replaced them with all the folks on the top row. You can see it went from all folks of color on the bottom to all folks of not color on the top. I'll give you an example right now. Um, let's see if I have an exact number. Anyone want to take a guess what kind of diversity Donald Trump is bringing in? The federal courts right now? He hasn't nominated anyone of color, has he? Um, Asian Americans only. Yeah, he's 89% white and 11% Asian American have been the judges so far. And the nominees that are in the pipelines as well. Zero African American judges. Yeah. Women. women, he is at 79% men and 21% women. Wow. So he's kind of along the lines of how Reagan has gone. Yeah, only Reagan. Uh, no Latinos, I'm sure. No Latinos, yeah. So there's some that are very interesting for us too, that you should take note of. Katina, um, Asian, um, Southeast Asian? Pacific, Asian. Pacific, yeah. Um, you'll see there's a gentleman, uh, you might have heard of this, Thomas Farr. Have you heard about him, Thomas Farr? He's a nominee for the federal courts in North Carolina for the Eastern District, which they call the Black Belt. That's where most black folks who live in North Carolina live, is in the Eastern District. <coughs> Obama tried to get a gentleman, um, an African American, to be the first federal judge in North Carolina. They didn't approve him. Who did uh, Trump put in his place? Thomas Farr. Thomas Farr is the protege of Jesse Phelps. Mm -hmm. Anti voting rights, white supremacist. Yeah. So this is this is an issue. And then we have our own here in Pennsylvania. So Rebecca Haywood on the left would have been the first African American woman to sit on the Third Circuit Court of Appeals in Pennsylvania. Her nomination um, sat there and never went through. So when Obama you know, was no longer in power, her nomination went away. Eminently qualified, uh, U.S. Assistant Attorney out of Pittsburgh, 13 years. Most of these federal judges haven't served that long. Uh, some of them are just professors, like Stefano Spigas, University of Pennsylvania professor. He took her spot. They confirmed him um, not too long ago. Yeah, so that's our new Third Circuit Court of Appeals judge, Stefano Spigas. This is what Stefano's Bebus is all about. All right, you see this? He thinks prisoners should be forcibly conscripted to the military. The drug addiction is not a disease, so can't be folks to school them. Over incarceration is not reflective of racial disparities in our justice system, it's just a liberal narrative. Oh my God. So, has he ever tried? He has. Okay. He has tried cases in the Supreme Court. Uh, as a professor at University of Pennsylvania, he's a criminal law professor. Okay. And he has argued cases in the front of the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. This is the thing about Stephanos Bebas. He's not as crazy as the other ones. Right. And so the White Courts Matter Coalition, our coalition, we let him go. Because he hasn't been as crazy as the other ones. Mm -hmm. That's not as crazy as the other ones. He's smart. So we went to we have, to, we have to save our political capital because there's another gentleman that they try to get onto the Third Circuit Court of Appeals to talk about in a second. So this is Stefano Spivas. He's our new Third Circuit Court of Appeals. He'll sit in, in uh, Philadelphia. So why did Senator Patrick withhold his blue slip? That's why Rebecca Haywood never got a hearing. Senator uh, <coughs> withheld his blue slip. He never turned it in. And honoring tradition, uh, President Obama and the Senate Judiciary Committee here, uh, Chairman Lynn Lane, they didn't let it go through. She didn't have a blue slip. So at this point, that's still in place. They, they're still honoring the blue, blue slip. Oh, but they did on that one? No, for this one, Casey actually turned in his blue slip. Casey turned in his blue slip later. Toomey turned it in immediately. Casey wanted to read everything about Bebus. He's a prolific blogger. He had like 40,000 pages of blog. 
and didn't even read to find out about him. That's where they got all that information. Now, Casey turned in his blue slip for Bevis because he doesn't want this gentleman right here, David Porter, David J. Porter. He doesn't want him to be the Third Circuit Court of Appeals judge. There is one more open on the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. We don't want this gentleman on our Third Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, I'll just tell you a little something about David J. Porter. He used to be Rick Santorum's personal attorney. <laughs> <laughs> 